So guys, welcome to another interview. And I am absolutely delighted today because I've got uh, an old client, a friend of mine, who's also a dating coach as well. And as you will most certainly see on this channel, I'm going to try and get as many dating coaches as I possibly can. But today I am very fortunate to be joined by Joe, who is actually currently out in it's Vietnam, right? It's uh, Vietnam, just, yeah. It is Vietnam. So there is a, a bit of a time difference uh, between the two of us. But Joe, thank you so much for joining me uh, on this one. And uh, I mean, if anything, how how have you been? What what have you been up to since uh, I saw you? Because it's been quite a few years anyway, since I know that you were at least yeah. in London. And then uh, certainly before the lockdowns, right, you moved abroad and you've happily been there since. Well, actually, I went back. Uh, I've been in I've been in Asia for nearly seven years. But during COVID, I did go back to England for about a year. Oh, wow. OK. And, uh, yeah. So I've been backwards and forwards. And I actually decided after going back to England, I was like, no, I'm going to go back to Asia and keep living there. And, you know, pros and cons. I think Asia overall wins. Yeah. And there are things I miss about England, obviously, but. Yeah, so here I am. Yeah, so it's been a while. It's been a, it's gone quick. And yeah, yeah. Really, since the last time we spoke, I feel like I've learned a lot. You know, I've like kind of um, had some big realizations about life in general. So maybe we can get into that. Yeah, no, absolutely fantastic. So uh, def So for uh, as a heads up to guys, I mean, Joe has been in the dating industry for easily over a decade, and I met Joe. I think. It must have been like 2014, 2015, something around that kind of era, uh, especially when the pickup industry was probably at its peak um, in London. Um, I know at that moment in time, I think I was like constantly multitasking between about a dozen different dating coaches uh, doing all the filming on the street. And yeah. you're someone who, uh, when, I'd, when I'd first heard of you, Joe, I remember you were someone who... I definitely you'd worked with Bexter and then uh, I think you'd kind of done the rounds. I think you'd worked with like every, every dating coach, right. Or every dating coach company, I should say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of like a guy that people would hire to sort of take over extra clients. If that makes sense. There are all these different small companies and I just became friends through friends, you know, quite a lot, especially living in London, living in central London. And yeah, I just became a guy that, was out a lot. If I saw a dating coach, I recognized. I go and introduce myself, and I had I didn't really have my own company, as it were. Mm. So yeah, I would have people to introduce me, and I'd get referrals, and yeah, I built up a client list with that, like that. And I still have a lot of these clients over twelve years. I still in contact with them, and you know, still giving them advice, and you know, you know, very good close friends. Some of these people, I'd, I'd actually consider some of my best friends so mm. yeah it's, it's pretty cool yeah and I, I think that was one of the things that I always really liked uh even over the years even when I think I'd first met you because I mean your name certainly always came up with between like different coaches and even with their clients yeah. as well just the kind of level of dedication and care that you always gave to someone like it was never just uh oh you've worked with them and then off you go it was uh, like you'd check in with them and you'd see how they were doing or you'd even like invite them out for a drink or something and then you'd catch up with them that way. So I always really kind of appreciated um, that kind of care, uh, I think, that you had with people. Um, what what sort of stuff, though, did you used to help guys with? Because it wasn't just daytime, right? It was also nighttime, I think. Yeah, so I was big on night game. Let's call it night. Like meeting women at night, basically going to bars and clubs. And that's only because I was a club promoter. Uh, right. And I was a club promoter for five or six high-end nightclubs where you would be paid to get girls into the club. Yeah. More girls you got, yeah. the more money you got, obviously. You, the girls were getting for free, but they would give you a tariff to how many... And they had to be of a certain quality, looks-wise. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is well-known, but this is how clubs work in central London. It, like High-end nightclubs through the world women are literally treated currency <laughs> so yeah so that that was that that was a, that was the job i was doing and it tied in with the, the coaching so i'd take a client with me to the clubs 
and it kind of worked together, you know, hand in hand. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would have to go and approach groups of women on the street and be like, let's go to the club. And I would do it through, you know, meeting women during the day as well. So, and I wasn't, I wasn't very good at it, if I'm honest. Um, I was more, I was always like, like you said, I was always more passionate about the coaching and seeing a guy and seeing really what is, you know, what he could do to, to really change those few things in his life to do with his, you know, his anxiety as your channel is about mainly. Mm. So I was passionate about that because it was what I was dealing with. And it was fascinating. It was a fascinating topic. And I was basically my own test subject. Um, and, you know, I think getting into this whole industry, it was because of what I was going through. And I just wanted to learn as well as, you know, it came away to coach and learn at the same time. I was always learning myself. So, yeah, that was um, that was basically how I got into it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because that was going to be, uh, if anything, my next question. Like, you know, uh, I mean, first of all, it's it's fascinating to hear that um, that the because of the club promoting thing, in a way, that's probably like the dating coach's perfect job, or for anyone's kind of perfect job in regards to just that development of getting good with cold approaching. If it forces you not only to have conversations, but on the business side of things the only way you're going to probably make money and be successful is by making sure that these clubs are getting women coming through them. Yeah. Yeah. And it was difficult. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. It, it was, I mean, fair play to anyone that's still doing it, could do it. But when I look back now, I don't look back with regret or like anger or anything. Um, when I look back, I think, wow, like how did I manage to do the job? Um, it took a lot of discipline, you know, to go out during the day. Yeah, and I can that. imagine. And it, I mean, looking back now, I haven't really thought about this for a while. Just kind of remembering some of the times. But yeah, some of these parties we went to, like all of these different girls that I'd met, and it was, you know, it could be, it was quite stressful because uh, the very ge the general nature of that industry was very, was very competitive. There's a lot of backstabbing and then the randomness of women's behavior as well. Like it would rain, so groups wouldn't come or they would be hijacked by another club, club promoter, go to a better, go to a different club. So, it, you know, I had to become very resilient. And yeah, it was, it was, it was but I'm thinking about it now, I had some amazing nights. And yeah. Kind of crazy to think mm -hmm. that I actually did that for so long. I did that. I think I did that for three years. Yeah. So. And 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 amazing memories. Met a lot of celebrities. I met bet. amazing women. Yeah, it was. Is it, it was who's crazy. who are some of the celebrities that that you met? I'm I'm curious. Um, I, I can I can name loads. Uh, David Hay. He was on my table. This is when he just beat Valuev. So All David right. Hay became the world world heavyweight boxer, a world champion. I was having a good conversation with him. He was good friends with a girl that I was promoting with. Um, and he just wanted to sleep with her. I think. <laughs> um, it's always the case he, isn't it as soon as uh as soon as a guy probably wants to sleep with someone they'll be like, like bend over backwards yeah, for them to try and make it happen yeah he, he was on our table um uh, van, edwin van der Sar. he was yeah he, he just retired so i think i think he was still at man united at the time um he did he came to a club once and caused chaos because it just caused everyone to go there that night <laughs> i made right I made, I made I made like five or six hundred quid in one night. He did. He came, and we got paid double for every girl we got because the club wow. was just like we need girls, we need girls, we need to come back. Yeah. So, um, say what what you want about P Diddy recently, but thank you P Diddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, well, to be fair, yeah, we're going quite, if we're going back like a decade ago anyway. Then I mean, uh, yeah, very very different kind of story that that probably played out then. And it's quite crazy because some of these clubs are still open and some of them are not. They're just. I don't know what they are now, but when I was back in London last time, I, I had to kind of look around to see if where these some of these clubs and yeah, they're just not there anymore. And it's you know, there's a lot of good memories in these places. So. Yeah, but I mean, it, it it was it was a it was a job. I wouldn't really use this. I mean, a lot of guys, there's a lot of dating coaches that kind of do this as a you know um, as a marketing thing where they'd be like, right, come to Colombia, we got this club, 
and it's the lifestyle, the social circle. And I'm and I'm just I'm not a fan of it because it just promotes this idea of this this, this unrealistic lifestyle that yeah. guys are living. You know, it's kind well, of it gives, it gives more of like um like a brothel sort of feel in, yeah. in my mind. It doesn't sound like it sounds like guys will get a good experience, but it doesn't sound like they're gonna it's gonna give them life skills that they can take yeah. away. It's it's more uh, like you say, it's more like club promoting than anything, I think. And of course, no guy's going to say no to going somewhere where there's just going to be loads of hot women who will be head over heels for them, uh, especially if they're foreigners. And... Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, interesting. Well, I, I think if anything, I want to almost go like start from the beginning in regards to like what got you into the industry in the first place? Like what what drew you to it? Were you always someone who was good with women or were you very like shy and anxious? Like, like what, what drew you down the route of being um, a dating coach? I was in the middle when I tell guys about this, I always say like, I wasn't really shy. I wasn't really full of anxiety. Um, but then on the other hand, I wasn't the, the, the guy, like the guy that was getting on the girls. Um, I never got with girls. I really wanted to get with. It was always kind of the, like the ones that were kind of left over at the party and I know that sounds so horrible to say but it was always the um, not so attractive girls that I just didn't quite fancy I never had a girlfriend that I was like oh, this girl's so beautiful you mm. know all my friends from school I'm still in contact with from a lot of my friends from school they've all got married they were married now and well, you know, got kids and stuff but they all got with these girls at the party and I'd always be left with kind of the let's say the nutritionally challenged girl that um uh, I love. I always love the PG way of explaining. This but you know, what I'm saying like it was. It was never. It was never like I weren't getting with girls. There was a couple of girls I got with. I was not like this hard case virgin that tried to learn techniques to get girls. And then I did have a bit of a period where at university, I did have quite a lot of success, and I didn't know any techniques, or I wasn't you know, working on myself in any way. But I think it's just that. When you're at university, that's kind of the case. Right? Mm. That's the case for a lot of guys. But it was when I finished university, I had this social drought, and I was depressed. I was I was just working a full time job in a restaurant, and um, yeah, I was without a you know without a girlfriend or having any sign of like physical contact with women for so like nearly a year. And my friend was like, "You got to read this book. It's called The Game," and that was. 2007 mm. and, it, and uh that was 2007 2008 i think yeah when well, it came I, I i got introduced to it in 2009 and i'm pretty certain yeah it had only been out for a couple of years when i were, worked at pua training because it was like a month later after right. i'd read that book had all my sort of mini experiences of talking to women and getting some results from it um yeah. yeah it was about a month later that i'd worked at pua training and obviously they were really big on it on on the book it, it was like even even though the book had been out for a couple of years it was still the topic i think for every single guy that i met at either the workshops or boot camps or even the coaches everyone referenced it and of course you had like mystery who was very uh relevant in london as well at the time i mean he was constantly i think in and out of the city um, and certainly liaising with all of these different coaches. Um, yeah, every, it was, it was, I remember it was literally the talk of the town, the mystery method, uh, and definitely Neil Strauss's book. So, but yeah, I do think it had only been out for a couple of years prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I read that book and it blew my mind, I think. And I think the one thing that a lot of guys can relate to when I say this is that you can, you can make changes basically and it all affects. Um, and then there was all these kind of cool ways to get attention, these routines and lines. I was never really into like the whole, oh, just learn pick up lines because I, I wasn't like, that was going to work. I didn't believe in the whole opener thing. Um, so I went down this route of just going out and doing opinion openers, having these long, like pleasant conversations with women. Then I, then I had a lot of friends, like, friends zoned a lot. Um, and the first night, I remember the first night I went out in London, I was actually living in Canterbury, the first night I went out in London ever. I've never been out in London before. I went out and just did a opinion, opinion open saw these women in the club, like big groups. And it was actually like a lot of people I was, I was 
I was on a kind of a work do in London, and they were like, "What are you doing? You know, <laughs> this is mad. You're making quite friends with everybody." And I was loving it, and it's you know it was completely innocent, really. When I think back, but mm. it, it was such an, it was so addictive. So that was where I fell in love with this idea of going out to nightclubs and just meeting people. And I wasn't too worried about getting laid or chatting women up. I was obsessed um, with this, this kind of these ideas of social dynamics. But on the other hand, there was a part of me that was still yearning to. Um, get approval from a beautiful woman, getting this kind of um, trophy to show off that I'd, my skills were working, if that makes sense. Mm. But there was that side to it, and I think that's that's very common. Um, and then, you know, I'm trying to distill this story as simple as I can without kind of... Uh, it's quite, it's quite... I guess it's quite linear, but then I... I mean, I was obsessed with this book. I wrote down all the routines, I got the rules of the game as well, that was and I used to take that out that book I used to take to the night club mm. <laughs> in Canterbury um, uh, and then what happened basically I saw that you know the guy Beckstar he's now Mystery's wing and they tore in the world of him he put an advert saying does somebody want, want to come and work with me and I was working full time I didn't really have any money mm. I literally quit my job and moved to London and then started club promoting with him wow. working for him as a working with him, like helping him, coaching. And that was it. And uh, then I was living in London and then I guess a couple of years late, later I met you. And uh, yeah, that's that's basic. That's kind of the outline of my story. Um, but it was it was pretty crazy. You know, I quit my job with no money, moved to London, moved in with someone I didn't know, like moved into his spare room, started going to these crazy parties. Was, was He would, he would not, he would be like joking, you, no, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I'd read the game and I approached probably maybe a hundred women. And he was like, right, just, just take this client out for, for a day in London. Like, okay. And I'd go around approaching women with, with this guy, you know, whoever the client was. And they'd be like, well, what about this? What about this? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. Like, like I was some kind of like extreme authority on it. Yeah. But the, but the thing is, like I did this for five or six years. Eventually I, I became an authority on this. Um, and in all honesty, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And um, but I, my biggest mistake was that I, I had this ego around it. And it wasn't until maybe a couple of years, maybe a year or two before I left for Vietnam that I kind of dropped that. And I said, look, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Because I went through a couple of painful breakups. And that's always the one, right? That's always the one where you go, right, what what do I need to do to change? Mm. What is it that's the real issue? Because I was very, um, I didn't take it very well, this break. I was with, you know, I, I was with this, this French girl for like a year and she was kind of like, all of all of this pickup and all of this, all of this self-development I'd worked towards, she was kind of, I'd got to this like level of whatever, achieved her, like a, a trophy sort of thing. And uh, yeah, and then um, when she broke up with me, it was like right, um, I've got to start again. I got really deep, and then I had some big realizations about myself. And you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep this as simple as I can without waffling too much. But that was it. That was kind of my story. Then I moved. Then I realized that I need to uh, travel. And uh, same again. I've quit my job. I bought a one-way ticket to Asia. Bought a one-way ticket to Bangkok. I didn't. I had about two thousand pound. Not much. Didn't have any out. You know, I had. I had clients because I was coaching still. So I. Had, but I wasn't guaranteed an income. I travelled around a lot, and yeah, that's it. I'm still here. So. Oh. I think that's really interesting. Um, just that journey that you went on, and in fact. Um, one of the things that you actually said there, which I, I'd love to explore, was you said that you had some revelations um, after being in the industry for so long. Um, what what kind of revelations did you have? Well, where do I begin? So probably the biggest one was the need for approval. The need for approval, the need for a women's approval specifically. Hmm. Um, I realised that 
there was one common denominator with all of the guys that I taught myself and all of the dating coaches. And that was this need for approval. It was all this big game for approval. And occasionally I would get a client that just wanted to overcome a little bit of fear. And then that was probably 1% of all the clients. 99% mm. couldn't get over that because of what I'm going to explain later. But yeah, the need for approval, there would be always this. Occasionally there'd be one client that didn't need that. They'd be like, okay, I've got this now. Thank you very much. Shake my hand. And you'd never really hear from them again. They'd have a, they get into a relationship and they kind of got it. You know, they kind of, they kind of just needed that just gentle hand on the back to go and approach women that they didn't know. And they just wanted to see that that was possible. So that it was almost like they needed permission to do that. That was very rare. And these guys had most of these, you know, mostly I'm thinking of specific people here, but they were very like, they, they had everything kind of together. Hmm. But then for the rest of the guys, it was more about, um, there was, yeah, the, the biggest realization probably was that, that it was a, this, this chasing and not all guys as well, this is definitely me, but the, the addiction to working towards getting a woman as well, this dopamine addiction of earning her through street approach, cold approach. Um, and the big realization that you didn't really need to do that a lot of the time, you didn't need to work. A lot of women, the right women, would like you for you. And then, then once that realization happened, it became my job as a coach to articulate that without sounding too cliche. Because the old, just be confident, be yourself, would then come in. And I hated that. But that's basically what people meant when people said that. But it's so much deeper than that. Um, because we don't really know what that means when we say just be confident. We don't know what that means when um, people say just be yourself. And then I, I made it kind of my mission to kind of understand that because I realized that that's what worked. Mm. That really was, it was, it was um, almost full circle as it were. So yeah. And another big realization was it was like the book, The Alchemist or The Wizard of Oz had it already you know all of that i went through um, there were glimpses of evidence of that that i was already good i was already good enough but i just kept looking for approval and people's permission and other coaches to tell me that i was good enough and the clients to tell me that i was good and these getting numbers to tell me that i was good or racking up numbers with sex to tell me that i was good and it just never did it you know it was never it was always chasing more so that was a big realization that there was more, that there was always more. Whereas that realization that you don't need any more, that you're okay as you are, um, there was nothing, nothing could be added. Um, and then I would, then I would say that it went even deeper than that. It was, it was more about life in general and the anxieties I had and the fears I had about facing my, you know, going out there into the world and doing what I wanted to do. Um, quite spiritual realizations and these are not new realizations in the, in the world stoics and you know christians have been talking about this for a long time and buddhists have been talking about these things for a long time and it really helped everything it really i really i guess overcame a lot so yeah that's probably a lot to unpack there but then i had some very deep realizations and i think a lot of guys do when they go on this journey yeah, no, it's interesting. I can relate to um to a lot of that, and I, I think over the years as well, when I've when I've worked with dating coaches, or I've seen guys who do get very addicted to doing pickup, um, I've noticed, especially I think ones who'd either created like an alter ego or who had completely tried to clean slate themselves, like try and remove themselves from this previous version that they were, that the pickup kind of world or, uh, to them starts to become their identity. And I think for a lot of guys that I've met, especially ones who have had like sadly mental breakdowns or they've needed like proper support for, for whatever reasons, um, that 
they can't remove themselves from the world of pickup at all because yeah. if they're not meeting and dating or sleeping with women they don't know who they are they just haven't got any kind of identity to them um they're not they don't know how to have a normal conversation with someone all they know is how to talk strategy to you know getting a woman into bed and there's no i don't know if maybe substance is the right word like they haven't got a personality behind that person that they've now evolved themselves into of just like yes I, I should only meet and sleep with women that that is what gives me that validation and says that i'm such a masculine man or i'm the guy that every other guy or even women should be jealous of because i've got this unique lifestyle that maybe many centuries ago would have only have been for like the the gods and kings per se um like I, i'm a big fan of like greek mythology and i think one of the the fascinating concepts with it especially before the stories of like how you had pandora's box which had trapped all of the different uh uh sort of emotions and stuff that that uh that the world was being kept secret of and yeah. it at the time it was only really for the gods who were who were deemed uh allowed to have affairs or cheat on on their partners and stuff um and you know and so of course it was always kind of this taboo idea of you know meeting and having just multiple partners and whatnot was really only available to to those at the very kind of top of the uh the social ladder um but i i have found that it's just a bit too heartbreaking when you do get guys that's so over obsessed with the industry uh like i don't understand the whole like red pill blue pill black pill thing i, I i've got i'd have to have someone probably explain it to me but um it does concern me when you do get guys who are just over obsessed with the world of pickup this is the only thing that they understand and they are almost preventing themselves from having any sort of realization or, or revelation even to you know that life isn't just about this there are more there is more things to life than just walking up and down oxford street to try and talk to strangers um and i think if anything i think a lot of guys almost tend to go full circle so you are very fortunate that you know you kind of said that you were sort of half and half that you were kind of like the shy guy, but also you were the confident guy. You had that kind of right sort yeah. of upbringing. But when I've certainly met guys who just haven't had that, they were the shy guy. They then get over obsessed with doing pickup. Uh, I know for me personally, um, one of the stories that I've shared with people is that I actually did have the full circle thing that I got so over obsessed with doing pickup that I remember I got to a phase where I was like constantly obsessed with being on the forums and whatnot. And I was trying to calculate the perfect approach and, you know, like what angle to go in, how, what should the perfect yeah. opener be, where the eye contact would be, how to transition, like, like all of that sort of stuff. It's wild to think about it now. But I remember it got to a point that I actually couldn't speak to anyone because I was already trying to think about the end goal before I even even did it. So I, I do think that kind of like over obsession with with pickup actually can backfire. It worked. It yeah. It, it made me weird. That's the thing. A lot of my, my, my mates from school were just like, you've become weird. Like, what are you, what are you saying? What are you doing? When you go out. And looking back now, I'm like, yeah, I was weird. I, I became somebody else. And it was it was almost like I'd built, like you said, an alter ego, this, this personality. But I think that's, and, and, and you know, I'll try and keep this. I'll try and keep I'll try and keep it as um you know down the line as I can with this. Oh no, be but... be as broad as you want, Joe. I'm, I mean that's what I think makes this fascinating. Yeah. That that I don't like I don't think people get to one one they don't realise really what uh it's like hearing from a dating coach the world that they've um kind of been in. Um, yeah. and it just, I think secondly, it just gives guys a lot more insight into it. You know, guys, again, if they're very obsessed with this, they kind of, I think it's usually with the people who have been introduced to the industry. So whether they've only just bought the game or they've just turned on YouTube and they've watched like an RSD video or yeah. uh, a different dating coaches video of sorts and like, holy shit, I can, I can do all this stuff. But I don't think they think about the implications 
of things because I don't think anyone tells them uh, like, like do it, but bear in mind X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I would say, like you said, when it comes to personality, so there are things I still think I'm so happy that I've learned. And maybe I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't done this, you know, gone on this journey. Mm. But definitely when it comes to personality, I think people's personalities are basically this, this, all it is is just this reward, negative and positive feedback loop. That's all a person's personality is. So the kid at school that learns that if he makes everybody laugh, he becomes the class clown, he becomes the joker, and then that becomes his personality. Or you get the guy that learns that he can make everybody laugh by getting drunk and doing stupid things. So he does that. Mm. And I think that that's what happens with guys in pickup is they, they develop that personality because they get this small reward. And even if the girl rejects them or whatever, it's just this adrenaline rush and then it becomes their personality. Then they meet other guys, they can share their stories, that becomes their personality, it literally becomes their world. And it's quite a big realisation to re have to realise the kind of mechanics of what a personality is step back from that so then you can yeah you can craft the personality you have to have a personality you can't you know you can't just you can't relate to people and then i've been completely you know unrelatable for a time there, there was a time when i really had all these big realizations and i was i went like you said blackfield i was like what's the point in anything are we our personalities like what's the point of all of this so i went through that phase as well and then it isn't until you, you, you kind of have to go through these phases. You don't have to go as, that intensely, but these are big realizations. And then you realize, yeah, you, you, you can be who you want to be, but underly, underlying all of it is the authentic you, the real you, which isn't anything really. It's my personality. It's kind of like the humble self. And that's a big realization that's going very deep as well with this as well. So that's the, the authentic self that you kind of tap into when you're not trying to impress you're not trying to be anything special that's when it really does work with a woman because it's the real you and if it doesn't then it's not supposed to be and that's where you've got to get to, got to, get to the point where you can just let go and that became a big part of my um, coaching and that's i think that's the biggest source of anxiety is this attachment to some sort of expectation which by the way i, I mean I can give you the key to approach anxiety. So this can be the kind of intro. Uh, so after like 15 years of approaching women, cold approaching women, I know what the key to approach anxiety is. I know how to solve it. It's very simple. Um, so this can be like, you can kind of clip this. Be like, yeah, yeah, no, no deal. Well, uh, I'll, I'll add uh, like a drum roll in and, and, yeah, and yeah. stuff. <laughs> but, I'm, but it took a long time to learn these things. And, you know, if I still what I teach into a couple of things it would be um, that it really is about and you've got to learn how to say say that learn. say that again Joe because the audio went Did for a second up? yeah yeah just say, um, just say that bit again you've got to learn how to manage your attachment to outcome right that's it and approach anxiety is basically in a, is, is a hoping of some kind of outcome and or not, you know, you don't want it to go a certain way. Um, so the key then is to have a very, a very, uh, a very alert sense of any outcome. You don't want to have an attachment to it going good or bad, and you have to be very present. Um, so there's still going to be fear. It's not getting rid of the fear. That's the difference. The guy, the guys that think that they want to cure anxiety or get rid of the anxiety, shall we say? You're not going to. That's the first mm. step. Is let us know that you're not going to. Yeah. Um, and then be okay with it. Then be okay that that feeling is not something that you have to get rid of. And it's not your enemy. It's not. It just is. It's just inside of you. It's just a sensation. It's just a feeling. And then you start to realize that that itself will then start producing thought. And thought isn't necessarily you either. So what you are is that silence behind the thought. You are the consciousness behind the thought. You become very present and watch the thought and not get lost in the thought and this can all be done by a little bit of meditation you can do this by being very aware of your thoughts and the, the biggest mistake that guys make and it and it's the same approach anxiety meditation ties in is that you don't want to get too lost in the story in the, the, the imagination because it's not you it's not real 
So when you're approaching a woman, then you will have this kind of imagination, this future projection of how you want it to go or how you don't want it to go. Be just aware of that. Be like, okay, my mind is doing this usual thing. And then just go and say whatever. Go okay, say hi. How's it going? How's your day going? And keep it really simple. But you've got to be very alert to the fact that she could give you that instant negative reaction, whatever it is, or, or positive reaction. You're not hoping it goes well or bad. You've just got to be very alert. Mm. And it's almost like you play the card as it's dealt. You're not too far into the future. And that's what you practice. That's, and, and, and use yourself as a kind of like a social experiment. You don't want to take it personal. She might be having a bad day. Some people are just rude. Nothing to do with you. You know, this is this. And, and just keep going along those lines. I promise you it'll get easier and easier. That's that's how to start speaking to people that you don't know. And I, and it took me so many years to go along those like go along those lines. Now I speak to anyone. I, I still get anxiety. I've been doing this fifteen years. I still have like a bit of butterflies. But it's just now how I how I deal with it. Mm. And how I and how I view it and the mindset around it. So that's approach anxiety. And I swear to God that would change your life. And it's so exciting knowing that because yeah, you've got to be alert. You've just got to be alert. You've just got to be really um, pay attention to how you're going to react. That's the key. Like, mm. There's a space around that. It's not, there's no expectation. There's no set. Hope it goes this way. I hope, it, Like you said earlier, I, I would have these uh, uh, kind of... I'd play out how I want the perfect approach to go. And you don't want the perfect approach. You almost want... You don't want to have any idea of how it's going to Mm. You just got to be planning that you're going to deal with it as it happens, yeah, and that you're going to deal with that fear. That's that's all you need to worry about. And then you don't think about it. I used to just go around in my head. Well, if I say this, you'll say this, blah blah blah, and you're just in your head all the time, missing opportunities. And then when you do meet people, you're not real. You're in your head. You're trying to you're 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 trying to figure out if it's working, not mm. working, or you're what to say to make her attractive, or whatever it is, and there are things to make a woman attractive. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you don't need to think about that. It doesn't take much thought. That just takes doing. And it, it requires very little thought. In fact, it requires no thought. So, yeah, I hope that, hope that kind of helps. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I've got on that. Yeah, it's, it sounds like, Joe, you've gone very um, stoic since the last time uh, then that I'd yeah. actually met you in London. So I, I guess, I mean, because I, I think that's fascinating. And actually what I... I, I I really do love what you've said there because I, funny enough, I actually did videos with that exact same concept uh, about a month or so ago. So it's, it's great that then it kind of reiterates um, exactly what I've suggested to people. Like don't go in with an expectation, just try yeah. and be as present as you can. And uh, as what I've been taught with stoicism is like, just worry about the things that you have control over which is your emotion and how you respond to things, how yeah. she reacts, you have no control over. So why worry yeah. about it? Why, why concern yourself with her reaction or why concern yourself with the conversation that you're going to have? Just literally go in. Uh, in fact, when I, when I've actually taken some guys out on the street, every single guy would, I would say to him, like, just go in, be really curious and ask her something that you're very curious about with her. Yeah. That's it. And then hilariously, they're all like, they all give me this sort of stubborn, they're like, oh no, I, I can't do that, Daniel. I've got to say something more, more serious. And I'm, you know, copying uh, uh, or using Johnny Berber's line here. I, I would say, you know, trust the process uh, or enjoy yeah. the process. And they would go over and lo and behold, they would just come back absolutely bewildered that they just had a really nice conversation and that it felt stress-free it wasn't that scary or about a minute or so they calmed down and you know and it was just an effortless conversation all because they weren't thinking this calculated way to talk to people yeah exactly. um and 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 they were just having a great time and in fact do, do you remember john cooper at all uh, uh yeah i actually spoke to him recently yeah yeah he's he's, he's his own youtube channel now he's doing really well yeah he's doing fantastically well and and i'm, I'm going to interview him at some point as well because i i right. uh, i mean he did he made some revolutionary changes you know absolutely in the yeah. industry um and you know and he yeah, taught me 
Yeah, I mean, he taught me certainly some some amazing mindsets um, with it. So John, part of like one of John's training is like he teaches people to be more altruistic and not so outcome dependent. Yeah. Um, and that was something that really resonated with me when like like years back, he'd invited me to one of his coaching things out in Barcelona, uh, like yeah. literally just to go and have, he was working with clients and he'd invited me along. He said that Daniel, you can have the experience as well. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, pay for your flights, accommodation and stuff. And, and I went along and it was such a beautiful experience, just going over and just starting conversations with people. Yeah. Not being outcome dependent, not even worrying the slightest on, you know, am I trying to sleep with them or not? And he had an exercise that was just about being really altruistic. Um, yeah. and, and I think for me, that's what kind of really captivated me with the idea of stoicism of the, yeah, you don't just worry about yourself, worry about how you react. Don't worry about with her. The best thing that you can do is show yourself show yourself off in the best possible way and yeah it's up to her to either accept that or not and if she doesn't that's absolutely fine and like with what you mentioned you don't know what's going on in her life and i don't think guys realize that either they don't think like oh maybe she's having a bad day maybe she's got family problems maybe she's got work problems maybe she's stressed about like her essays or studies and stuff yeah. Um, or even on the, the, the some scenario, sometimes you just catch women at the wrong time of the month and they, you know, and you, you've just sadly just picked badly, uh, that conversation, yeah, yeah. you know, so it happens, but guys then take it, I think too much to heart. They are most certainly then bothered about it. And I just try and say to them like, like, no, just worry about how you react and the rest will really kind of fall into place. Yeah, I mean, I will go one step further and you can do, you can apply this to everything. Like it's any stressful situation, any situation that gives you anxiety. I'm a boxer. I've been boxing a lot recently and, and that's taught me being, you have to be present when you're boxing. But um, we'll talk about that in a second, but I want to stick to this like idea of approaching, approach anxiety is something that a lot of guys want to yeah. really understand, but. One thing I and and just to add on to that, it's the the key I want to really emphasize is you've got to watch your reaction, almost like a spectator with no judgment. And you can't judge yourself, so mm -hmm. that's the key. It's, it's just a, a a silent watching of your your reaction, like you're floating above yourself doing whatever you're, you know you're approaching her and you're and you're just watching yourself. Oh, that's interesting, and that made me nervous. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's there's no judgment. There's no judgment of her. And there's no judgment of you either. It's just a silent spectator that's kind of lurking in the background. Which mm. is the truth of what you are is silent watching of your mind because you're not any of this. You're not your thoughts. You're not your anxiety. You're not your guilt. You're not your shame. And these were big realizations for me, and it made it so much easier. I started to stop having this. You know, I'd I'd always have this kind of arrogance when I spoke to like guys and stuff. Like I'd be judging them, or maybe you know that, or or if a girl wasn't attractive, I'd be like, oh, this girl isn't, you know, there was this ego that's trying to, you know, she's not part of the, the game, she's not part of my plan, and I was treating her as a means to an end. With this, it's it's everybody is then invited, there's no judgment, it's, it's completely in inclusive of everybody, so there's no, um, you know, it's, it's it takes practice, and yeah, essentially, the world will just keep giving you opportunities to be present thing it's the beautiful thing about it and it's quite spiritual um but when it comes to attraction as well there are things to know that what women respond to and, and the, the issue was that i was just trying to get over approach anxiety you know this is for years i was running around oxford street like i said trying to build up the courage and then if i did it did she either like me or she didn't and i was and i thought from just doing that i would get attraction and it wasn't until that i started learning what women respond to and then incorporating that with approaching. And mm. that was a big, that made a big difference to me. And understanding the masculine feminine polarity, that was a big deal. So it's, it's, it's almost like I had to overcome. And, and a lot of that masculine feminine polarity is what we're talking about now. It's what we're talking about when we're dealing with issues. See, the biggest difference between men and women is that, is that we men are logical. Women are, are more inclined to respond to that emotional part of their brain. Mm. which 
um, when men do, it makes them feminine. That's why men get friend zone. That's why men can't figure out women. And that's why women get really annoyed with men because they become emotional. They And what all that means is they're not um, being in their masculine. They're not directly doing what they need to do. They're looking for permission. They're in their heads. They're, they're, they're in their thoughts. That, 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 they're an imposter. Mm. So to approach a woman with complete presence, and to go for what you want that's extremely masculine that's extremely attractive for a woman and that is quite what robert glover and so this is another uh, kind of mentor of mine someone that really helped me is dr robert glover author of no more than a nice guy all right yeah i started to kind of, i started to kind of go deeper on the kind of therapy side and the anxiety side of this rather than just go for the you know what other pickup coaches are telling me that would work. Mm. When I really discovered what I was suffering from, and I think a lot of guys that are into pickup are suffering from nice guy syndrome, whether they're on the narcissistic side or they're just the typical, you know, searching for mum's love, nice guy syndrome. And I think it's about 80% searching for mum's love. I mean, it's all searching for mum's love on some level, but the narcissism came out in certain UAs as well, certain coaches. Mm. Um, I don't know the, the microphones out there, but yeah, top of Dr. Robert Glover, and he's a lot of his philosoph- philosophies blew my mind. And going back to what you said about like running up and down Oxford Street, a lot of guys are doing that. And it's what what, what what one quote that Robert Glover, Dr. Robert Glover said, and he stole that from David Deada, is. Choose women that choose you because there's only some women that's going to like you. I mean, you could be extremely good looking, jacked, rich, and certain women are not going to like you, right? And it's going to be rare, but still, it's still going to happen. I see it with my friends that were like still getting rejected by women, even though they were better looking, even though they were like had more money. They were still on point with what they're saying, you know, they were funnier. So it blew my mind that, yeah, look. Not every woman's for you. There's going to be a compatibility issue as well. So, a lot of the a lot of the PUAs that are learning this stuff, they're knocking on closed doors. And you've got to find the doors that are open. You've got to choose women that are giving the right, the right signals, the right feedback. Forget the ones that don't. Don't waste your energy in them. And the biggest mistake I made for years was chasing women that weren't interested in me, thinking yeah. I could game them, I could find the perfect way around this. You know, eventually make them attractive. Yeah. Well, I think well, we all we all had um, had those kind of moments because there's something very uh, alluring. Uh, I, th- I think that's probably the right word, alluring, uh, about trying to get a woman who's clearly given you a lot of shtick and 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 sort of saying like, "No, we will never be together. No, nothing's going to happen." Yeah, it becomes and a prize, you... right? Yeah, it's like we 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 equ- we equate that with the effort. So if mm. we work for something, we equate that with the idea that we have to work hard for things. Um, which isn't necessarily true, you know. It's not necessarily true. That you have to work hard. So, yeah, it ties into that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but but definitely definitely that that book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. I mean, a lot of this has been a, it's been a it's a long journey, and I think that a lot of guys once they get away from just a pro cold approach, <laughs> and are getting over approach anxiety. But that's a big step. I mean, being really being present and. and that that expectation and letting go of a lot of expectation Mm. Uh, so what i'm curious then joe what what sort of things then did you do to implement these changes i mean you you mentioned definitely i I think a little you touched a little bit on like um meditation and uh and how guys can kind of be uh, or the sort of stoicism um mindsets that guys should definitely adopt uh but i'd love to actually hear like you know what things did you do to uh, implement these changes over the years until they were ingrained. Yeah. Oh well. Um, okay, so I stopped viewing. I stopped taking things personally, and I did that through uh, meditation. And and all I was doing was, and it's really simple, was watching when I would get upset by things. Okay. And I'd be that's interesting. What am I attached to? What part of me am I defending? You know, if a boss told me that I was, I needed to sort something out why would i defend that you know why would i not just take his criticism what part of me was really attached to that and i started bringing space around that and that is probably the most life-changing thing to do because 
then you can actively, without ego, seek out advice. And I started doing it with uh, every area of my life, you know, like my career, my money, how I should dress. Uh, I was doing it with girls I was dating and I just wasn't taking things personally. And once I did that, I realized that I could really handle a lot of fear. Um, uh, so it was kind of like a spiritual, uh, it's a meditative practice to really be aware of when I had this. And it, it doesn't mean be passive. Like there are times you, you quite stick up for yourself, you know what I mean? But when you do stick up for yourself, it's going to be a lot more grounded in what you know is right rather than defending an egoic position or this fake self of you that you're, you're, you're trying to, you know, like, you know, I had this um, ego because I was a dating coach. So I knew everything about women and I didn't want to, like, risk looking foolish so I wouldn't approach women. You know, it's a big deal. A lot of dating coaches have a lot of approach anxiety because they're scared to look silly in front of their clients, you know, and I didn't have that because I was like, right, sh I'll show you what it looks like to be ego. Like, I don't have an attachment to this. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Um, so that was a big deal and it, and it turned into a meditative practice that I did every you know I would go out and I'd always remind myself while I was working you know, my job or I was running a pub so I was like right I'm going to be very alert when my boss says something that's going to annoy me just watch my reaction to it and then you don't become what Eckhart Tolle would says Eckhart Tolle the author of the power of now I highly recommend that book he says you've got to be very alert to your reaction. Like I said, it's it's like you become you become the watcher. When someone cuts you up in traffic, you notice that part of you that's angry. Who's angry? Like really, uh, that's that's the part of you that you've got to start bringing space to, mm. and it it deepens. It, it gradually increases over time. There are times when you forget, you go in and out of this, obviously. But the interesting thing is when you have these realizations, and this is the curious thing about life is that when you have something quote-unquote traumatic happen, it will either make you more identified with who you think you are, or you leave it even more. You become even more detached and peaceful. And this is the thing. Like, you, a lot of guys will say, well, you know, I am my problems. I am my personality. I am my ego. I am this. I am who I am. You are and you're not. Like you are hmm. and you're not. And yeah, it's that, it's that belief on their identity. Uh, so in some of the eye movement yeah. therapy training that, that I had, this actually came up as a discussion um, or part of the training that yeah. there's like a self-fulfilling prophecy when it comes to limiting beliefs. So if you hate something about yourself, you're kind of manifesting it to become true. And you're just creating yeah. this spiral of like it exists because I believe it exists and I believe it exists. So it's, or, or because I believe it, it in, in turn actually exists and it just goes round and round. So until that cycle is broken, um, yeah. it's why people tend to be but trapped in, I'm, in I, how they believe. that eye movement. How do you break that cycle then in eye movement? You then basically, you make it conscious then, is that how? Or? Yeah, so with, with the eye movement therapy, um, uh, obviously, I don't know if, how much you know of it, but I mean, it, it does look a little bit funny. much about it. Okay, so it's it basically allows me to detach unwanted emotions from pe previous memories. Right. Um, and through what I can only describe, which looks like Jedi hand movements, because there's a lot of like like waving your hand okay. around in a particular way. You get someone to stay very still as you're doing it, and you get them to shift their eyes whilst they're holding on to that memory. And it seems to create a disconnect with how they feel to what they can think about with that memory. And right, there are different yeah. areas of it. And, and and it covers two, which one is to actually to do with the past memories. And the other side yeah. is to do with the identity and limiting beliefs that people have. So yeah. you can basically, you can, if people, if you get people to think about the limiting beliefs that they have, you can then uh, kind of like what you mentioned before, but you kind of take a slightly scientific approach wiggle down to right, what specifically is the issue with that and then yeah. you go through different areas of someone's identity and then you do the eye movement therapy on each of those areas um yeah. and then you get them to change that perception of how they see themselves so yeah. like for example um when we use language such as i me and you you could be with all three of them you could be talking about yourself 
Uh, and also right, the self yeah. is included in that. So the I, me, self, and you, uh, those are the four areas. Um, you could you have very different language and attachments to each of those different identities, even though they're all you. Um, yeah. you know, when you're like like you can be very aggressive, like saying, How could you do that to me? You know, there, there's a there's almost like a negative connotation to it. Whereas if you say, Oh, I can do this there can be a very uh, egotistical kind of attachment. So, yeah, yeah. so depending on what people's emotions or, or issues are with the limiting beliefs, you can tweak each one of them. It, it's, it's fascinating how it works because even on, um, on the training, we had to do it on ourselves as well. And it's amazing right. how different you feel afterwards when you're starting to process a belief that you had and then you suddenly have this third person perspective on it and you're like, why was I thinking about myself in that way? Yeah, that you sounds like it. neuro linguistic programming. I've I've read a bit about this, right? With your eye, um, you're you're locating different memories, and then it's probably. I mean, it's it sounds like that's exactly what I was. Uh, you know, I was I was thinking basically that when you go through your life, you're not creating these new attachments. You're basically breaking the cycle as you go. Yeah. And it was it was a big deal for me to, to let go of a lot of emotions because I realized that I had a large um you know, I had a large story around guilt. Mm. And it wasn't until that was conscious that I realized I had that that I could let go of that. Yeah. And breaking that. And I didn't do it through how is I E M T, is it? Yeah. Yeah, that that's kind of the uh, the abbreviated version. Otherwise it's such a mouthful to have right, to yeah. say every time. Yeah. Um but with meditation, you can. The idea is basically you you would locate a memory by thinking about a, you know, and, it, and it's quite it's quite wishy washy, I guess. It's, it's, it's but there are certain um, you know you could you could identify limiting beliefs about yourself pretty simply by like thinking, well, what's stopping you, and then just keep going, you know, follow the trail of whys, and mm. you'll get to like well. And for most guys, it's, well, I'm not good enough. Or why? And then why are you not good enough? And it will probably be because you let somebody down or you did this when you were younger or, you know, somebody didn't give you enough care or love. It always comes to that. It's, it normally stems from that. And then you locate the memory, find out what that memory, that feeling of that memory is um, triggering. And then you decide, don't you, 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 you bring awareness to it and then that, in turn, disidentifies you, so you're not that story anymore. And our story's probably been that story. Those stories are running people's lives without meaning. Mm. Like you said, afterwards you, you set yourself different. And I think all it is is you bring consciousness to it. You bring a light of consciousness to it. You're not ran by this unconscious program anymore because you see it what it is. And that's all. It, it's all you need to do is see it what it is. Yeah. So I was talking about processing emotions, and a big deal for me was feeling like. If you just follow the trail of why is why you feel a certain way, like I said, it will always come down to um, not being good enough or this weird thing of not being good enough. This idea of self-esteem. This is a this is a this is a common thing I saw amongst a lot of guys and see amongst a lot of clients and you know you see it in a lot of people. This idea of having to feel to feel a standard to talk to somebody to and it's always an ego thing. It's always like. When you talk to somebody, something will happen. Like there'll be like four or five things. I can't remember exactly, but when you're in your head, this is, and it's always like, is this a test? Um, do you know more than me about this? Um, are you a threat or not? And then you're basically just waiting for your turn to interject when when you know something about the topic. And this is what people are doing when they're listening. And it's always this case of and, and like I'm saying about this type of meditation, what I did for so many years was um, you bring awareness to that. Bring awareness to when you're upset. Bring an, and, be, and, just, and just feel why. What am I attached to here? And, and try and go deep on that when you can, when you have time. And you don't have to go, you know, you don't have to build up. It's all about, it's all about bringing awareness to those um, emotions and realizing a lot of the time it's just a feeling. And you're producing a story around it. One emotion will hold thousands of different thoughts. 
and it's and, and when you start getting good at uh, catching it early, you don't go into your head. You don't go into this this, this future projection or what's going to happen when. You know, I'm really bad at giving examples because I just don't have that anymore. I don't really have that like anxiety that I used to have. And I remember it being in my head all the time, always worrying about things that were going to happen or not happen or I should have done or you should have done this, should have done that, regrets, guilt. This is all in me. And I was, I was carrying this a lot. And now I just live a very simple life. I don't have to think about this thing. I don't think about this. And I'm pretty sure it's come, it's come from a combination of... Um, traumatic events uh, coupled with uh, awareness mm. and um, it's made me peaceful it's, it's, it's really uh, given space around this whole self which I think is the biggest problem in most people's lives you know it's, that's, it's that. that's what causes anxiety it's this expectation this, this need for fulfillment your um, but like you said it's it's been the programs that have kind of been conditioned in us they come from childhood. They come from our mums, our teachers, our, our the friends that we had at school experiences. Um, I mean, one for me, just going deep on this, was when I was about five. I um, I got lost for like a day in a supermarket. I couldn't find my grandparents. Mm. It traumatized me. <laughs> so I always had that, and it was it was a memory that I had. And it brought up a lot of emotion, and it wasn't until I kind of brushed that, processed that emotion, I let go of a lot of fear, and um, I didn't realize that that was in me until I kind of, you know, went deeper. Well, why are you scared? Oh, in case people leave you, in case she abandons you, in case this person rejects you. Well, why, 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 why? Well, it's mm. because I got abandoned. Five, you know, like it's crazy to think, but you know, after that moment, I was like, it was almost like I was. I let go of a heavy backpack that I didn't know I was carrying and I felt very light and you'll know it when you have these moments like you said after that therapy that you did for the eyes it's probably very similar you've, you've, you've brought the light of consciousness to it you, you've processed it and this thing about emotions I think a lot of people don't realise this is that we need to process emotions by bringing consciousness to, the, to it and a lot of ways you know we, we either repress suppress or express emotion and none of that really deals with it we the, the myth is that we should express our emotions and they that really you know that deals with the emotion we get rid of it but there's always that residue left over afterwards it's only until you sit down with it and don't give it judgment and you actually process these emotions that they that you transmute them or whatever it is you do to them you let go of them i guess I mean, even that's not really accurate. You just bring a new story to it. You bring, you bring like your lightness to it. You bring space to it. So, um, a lot of these realizations really helped me. And I can say I probably wouldn't have got there if it wasn't for, uh, you know, ra- randomly approaching women on the street. <laughs> you know, it's quite funny that it took this, took this path of, of 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 these realizations. But yeah, um, you've probably had the same realizations, you know. Yeah, I, it's it's funny. I, I think there's um like an evolution that every guy yeah. goes through when they've been doing uh, approaching for so long. Like, uh, yeah. I, I'm sure I did a video, like it was one of my first videos on my channel. I kind of spoke about that guys go through this sort of like three or four phase cycle. That, that the first phase is this experimental phase. You just are pushing your comfort zone. You're testing the water, seeing where you're at. Then the next one's this sort of liberation phase where you have overcome whatever the limiting beliefs or that social anxiety that you were holding on to. And now you're just like ricocheting from person to person, almost acting like this, I suppose, crazy scientist, really just wanting to, you know, try experiment, talk to this person, see what happens, what kind of result and, and outcome do you get? Rinse and repeat, speak to this person and so on. Um, and then I think you eventually you kind of get to a plateau where you've now exhausted all of the things that you felt originally held you back. And it's no surprise that I think every coach that I've met and known over the years and including yourself has then eventually gone down a very kind of spiritual path because yeah, I think you're yeah. so enlightened. You've just, you know, that if anxiety isn't so much of a problem for you anymore, or a concern even is probably the better way to, to phrase it, 
then mm. I think, you know, what what's left? And I think there's a this interest in becoming this uh, ascended, self-actualized version of yourself. And that always seems to involve people either becoming very spiritual or perhaps maybe wanting to actually experience more connection with people because, uh, I mean, as you kind of know, the industry with uh, chasing women, I mean, it's not necessarily encouraging guys to have long-term relationships. I mean, most of what was advertised over the many yeah, years yeah. when we were in it was more about, yep, sleep with women, move on to the next or have multiple it women happens, to be yeah, dating, yeah. you know? So yeah. there isn't really that encouragement of having a connection and so I don't think it's any surprise that eventually you just get to this kind of point where you're like, you know what? I want connections. I want something more genuine and more uh, authentic where, you know, the alter ego is put aside for, you know, whatever kind of stage names, coaches or, or guys would give themselves. And they want to actually have friendships even and just people who want to be around them for them rather than. Uh, what I've known to have happened to coaches where guys only want to hang out with them because they want the skills that they've got, um, you know, rather than actually getting to know them and be friends with them. So, yeah, it's, yeah, I think the, it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of coaches have a as well. That's it. And you get yeah, them. you know, talk, I mean, I, I've always made the joke about that there's no honour amongst thieves. Uh, I think I yeah. probably took that from a computer game, but uh, everyone seems to be in it for themselves um, from what I'm I've kind of discovered really over the years in the industry because of just that addiction to wanting to to meet and sleep with women and uh and then it was just yeah, it goes, a, with the, goes with the territory i guess doesn't it? yeah yeah it, it does it and, it and it's kind of sad and unfortunately i think it's where then you know you get good guys or guys who had a lot of anxiety they go through the system and then they yes they become more confident but they don't become a guy that i think I don't know what the best way to, to word it is, but I don't think they become the best representation of themselves. They yeah, it's like an ethical integrity. Yeah. Wh wherever you want to go, you know, there's, there's a certain level of like self. Uh, yeah. I know what you mean. Like their, their values. I mean, they could probably, they could probably really dig deeper with some of the values that they're promoting. That would actually make themselves yeah. Good. And, and so they, they lose themselves or they lose their identity in it. And kind of what you, when you brought up about with like the eye movement therapy, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I have seen that with people over the years that what's interesting is that even then, like if they've got like a most recent trauma, even overwriting that, that doesn't necessarily fix the issue. There was probably yeah. something so far back when they were younger and it was probably the most inconspicuous thing that you could have even imagined, which is what led to the ripple effect. Like maybe their parent told them off for doing something, or maybe they had a class project in school and people laughed at them when they stood in front of the class. And that is where the ripple effect of anxiety kicked in. So it had nothing to do with approaching women. Maybe they never even got rejected by a woman, but because of some ripple effect from a different experience of having anxiety, is what has somehow just cascaded it into, right, that's now led to having a social anxiety issue or led to a confidence issue with being around strangers or or, or whatnot. So, yeah, it, there's there's certainly um, uh, a ripple effect that, that plays out with that. Um, yeah, like a feedback loop, feedback mechanism. So they learn. And it's interesting, like you said, you know, I think a lot of guys with a relationship as well. So a relationship is, is I would say, I mean, it's however you want to view success, but a lot of guys, the ideal would be to to have a girlfriend. If they really dig down what they want, they would want that girlfriend. I, I'd even go as far to say, Joe, that I would say nine out of 10 times guys that I've met who've gone to coaches, they all want girlfriends. Um, yeah, it's only me, really maybe the younger guy who comes along and he's like, yeah, yeah I want to date a little bit. You know, I'm young, I'm single. I want to, you know, I want to just experience stuff that i've never ex well, uh, experienced before whereas i think yeah the older guys or even then i mean yeah every, i think everyone goes through the the phase of i've got my confidence i want to date a little bit but ultimately i think everyone as that i've met wants wants a relationship they want a girlfriend or or, or more yeah and they, and they would sabotage you know they would get so like we talk, we spoke about the personality and then getting addicted to pick up a girlfriend that would mean that they weren't allowed to go out and you know do running around doing cold approach to that 
So they built this personality around it. They'd have to kill that personality, and it's too difficult for some guys. And I know that because I did that. I missed out on a lot of good relationships because I was this PUA, you know, I was this pickup guy, and it meant too much for me to like balance the two. And it and it and it it was weird. It, it was it was a sort of form of self sabotage, even though I don't really believe that you have self sabotage. But I, I feel like there was definitely a level of like deservedness on a relationship that I had to have before I got one as well. There was like a level of, you know, I had to earn a girlfriend. That makes sense. Yeah. Or I wasn't developed enough, you know, and it always comes back to that feeling of, you know, am I good enough? And yeah. It all plays into it. You know, this is, well, these are all beliefs we have about ourselves. And a lot of guys, they get into it. They don't, and, and this is something that's mind blowing as well, that I learned a lot about, through also uh, you know uh, talk about people that i've learned the most from and again robert glover he talks about the fear of success and this this topic has always fascinated me it's like well who's really a, you know if you want success just give it to somebody but it's so true because a lot of us fear, fear success because that means that responsibility and we it's almost like this is and this is mind-blowing for me is that we like our problems we like our hell we like our drama um and it's because we've associated who we are with that it's comfort it's comfortable to have loss it's comfortable to have rejection it's comfortable to have you know not it's it's it's, it's, it's better the devil you know you know the the the, the grotty ghetto that you live near you, it may be not very nice but we like it because we know it the uncharted territory even though it's it could be safer, is scarier because we don't know it, and that's the relationship. That's the that's the approach. That's that's the meeting. That's the that's, that's going um, and pushing the interaction further along the line, rather than just being like, "Oh, it was nice to meet you. See you later." You know, a lot mm. of guys do that. They it goes really well. They go up to a woman. They say hi. She's interested. She's smiling. She's doing that, and then they don't take the number or they don't arrange the date there and then, or they they don't have a plan. And they sabotage because they're like, oh, that's good enough. You know, it's like they, they had to prove to themselves they could do it. But the, that's not what they want. Yeah. But technically, it is what they want. It's sabotage. It's, it's, they're afraid of success. And it's such a fascinating topic because I was like, I wonder how I'm doing that. You know, and I kind of like, I looked at my life and I was like, well, where am I afraid? What is it about, you know? Um, and what come up was like things about money. I was really bad at saving because I was like, oh, I have to spend my money. And it was a fear of success. It was like I felt comfortable chasing money. Like I was more comfortable not having money. That was a big deal. So I was like, well, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? And I went deep on that. Um, so this so this is all tied in. You know, it's all related. And we really are. And, and, and I'm going to keep quoting him because it's, it's amazing. But Robert Glover talks about it to be like our minds – our minds are like a board of directors. And when you introduce a new idea, they have to discuss it. And maybe like out of 20, two of them are agree. We're like, yeah, we, we want better quality women. We want more money. And then the rest of them will be like, yeah, but, and they'll start giving ideas. So it's like you're focused on those two guys. That are like, yeah, we want better quality. We want more choice of women. Or, you know, whatever it is. We want um, more money. We want a better body. We want to, okay, so that's a good example. We want to lose weight. So, okay, but then people treat us differently. That means we might be better, you know, it, it's the board, all the other board members will disagree. And we are then going into this uncharted territory of success, which mm. means other responsibility, which means fear, which means uh, better not do it. And sabotage, you know, we, we're okay as we are. We don't eat some cake, don't go to the gym today. It's okay. Um, and it's fascinating. So going deep on this is it's the, the, the ways to uncover this and give practical advice is like we've been talking about. I think that uh, I have heard about it, but I've never done it, and I've always been interested in the I, IEMT, like you say. Well, I mean, also is at everyday life, you've got to be very life will give you the opportunity to see when you're um, rejecting things or or you're having this emotional reaction. And you've just got to be present. You've got to watch your reaction. And, mm. and you'll start to notice, well, why do I care about that? Why do I care that he's, he's pushed in front of me in the queue? 
all these things. And like I said, um, you don't, it doesn't mean be passive, but there's you are not identifying with that emotion and drunk with emotion. You're not becoming um, that little you, that ego. And all that is is a program. All of that has been programmed from since birth. So fear, all of these things. When you go to, you know, most guys won't go and speak to a woman because there is a program in there. It's just like, no, don't do it. We embarrass yourself. Now that guys are actually really, you know, putting the focus on this, use it as a vehicle. I mean, dating is a great way to really expose all of these programs we have and, and reframe it like this is a social experiment. So take the person and just see what comes up and put yourself out there. But yeah, I mean, that's great stuff. I mean, I would say also that a lot of guys know this as well, but when you understand that and then you understand what women want and what women want is this. You know, they want a man who shows up. They want a man who is taking the lead, who is making moves. And by the very act of doing that, she will be turned on. That's what turns a woman on. It's by acting without the need for validation in, in or, 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 or doing these things to, to get her approval. By the very act of doing it, that's what confidence is. In complete dedication to the act itself. Without outcome, that's what she'll get turned on by. And... Um, when you start to play to win like that, that's when you'll start having better results. Because a lot of guys there, they're, they're like, we, like we said, the biggest problem is, you know, you spend years trying to get over approach anxiety or overcome your limiting beliefs. But you've got to have a vision for yourself of what good looks like, you mm. know, and reverse engineer it rather than just trying to fix things. You've got to actually have it in your mind that you are that already. You know, you're not trying to... Uh, fill all these holes it's you have that already and you're almost like you're remembering who you are rather than you know there's a saying it's not fake it till you make it it's act as if until you remember who you are Mm. Um, i like that it's amazing right so it's it's like it ties into the idea that you're not trying to like prove yourself you know a lot of guys when it comes to confidence it's like i'm going to prove that i can do this prove no, that 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 insinuates that you're not good enough. This is the reverse of that. It's it's acting from a place of complete. You've got everything you need already. Um. Yeah. So that's it. I mean, I, I hope that makes sense. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't hear myself, so I can't know. I don't know how I sound. Yeah. No. This, but, no I mean. I mean. I mean. For me, being in the industry again for so long, just as long as you. Uh, I mean, it, it absolutely it makes perfect sense to me. So. Yeah, uh, I think if anything, then because we're we're sort of getting near the end now, uh, anyway. Because I'm also yeah, very yeah. conscious how late it is probably uh, for you if you've had a, a long day as well. Here is eleven thirty, so yeah. Probably okay, yeah. Well, I, I, I still want you to, I still want you to be able to have like a relaxed evening. I, I know what it's like when you, yeah, yeah. you've had a, you've had a long day and then you you go to switch off and instead you've got Daniel literally hassling you for, yeah. for to be talking about more more uh, more work stuff. Um, but I, I suppose sort of like as one of the, the a couple more questions I think that I've got for you, but yeah. um, as kind of like a summary, what, what sort of things would you advise to new guys who are thinking about going out and doing the, the pickup day game uh, sort of stuff? What, cause I, I, with your, with your experience, with your knowledge, what things would you advise them that you wish you'd have done when you first started? Oh man, yeah, it's it's a hard one. It's a hard question. I'll try and keep it simple, but I'll go back to that: choose women that choose you. Um, I, like really put your attention on women that give you something back. You know, um, in terms of interest, if they're not replying, let it go. Don't try and game. Don't try and don't try and figure them out. You know, as much as I'm saying, like. Women don't know why they don't like men as well. There's a lot. There's a lot. A lot of the time, they, they don't know why. Um, don't overcompl- don't overcomplicate things. Um, don't take things personally, um, and really practice that meditation. Like I said, like be very aware of your reaction, and treat everything like a social experiment, and be grateful because it's fun. Like it shouldn't be a grind. It shouldn't be a tra- chore. You know, I spent so many years like grinding this out, thinking I had to go, go and do all these approaches and force myself to do it. 
you've got to put yourself in a position where it's like you're a man that knows what he wants and he's having fun getting there. You know, that's the that's the and to quote Robert Glover again. That's exactly what he said. Like you've got to you've got to know what you want and be a fun guy getting there. And um, I mean, I, I I in some ways I wish I knew that at the beginning, but wisdom you've got to learn these things to really to let you know, be very wary of wisdom. Yeah, but it comes yeah. with age as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's took yeah. it's taken a long time to have these realizations, and I'm grateful. You know, I'm very lucky to know what I know now. I, I'm. And um, I wake up each day excited. I'm, I, I focus on what I have, not what I don't have. That's a big deal. If a girl's not interested, in it, I'm like, cool. I've got the ability to go out and meet new women. I'm meeting people all the time. Um, so yeah, that's I try. That's as, as, as much as I can summarize. But don't knock on closed doors. Don't go through the open doors. Um, there's plenty of women out there that will be interested if you keep showing up. Um, and yeah expressing yourself uh don't be afraid to piss women off um you know within reason you know like this is the thing we we as dating coaches we tread this line of um you know what guys you know what, what's this advice how how men have interpret this advice but one last thing on that is that if you if you understand consent it can be used in your advantage you have to understand that women are very sexual. Women want sex. They just need to know that you're safe enough and that you're a guy that when she says no, you'll stop. That's all you need to know. Like women, women, that's all they want to know. That's it. They're very open-minded. They like sex a lot more men than men. That's why they have like 20 different ways of like, having an orgasm. Men only have one or two. So, and women are women. Human women are the only species, I think, on the planet that have sex for actual pleasure, not to get pregnant. I think that's the only animal. So bearing that in mind, when you're approaching a woman, you approach her with the, mind, with the mindset that she's extremely open-minded and that, uh, you, you know, you, you will understand when she says no. And you know that. So you don't have to feel guilty. Um, you don't have to take it personal. You just know when to stop. That's it. And, and, and if you go in with that mindset and you really mm. go for what you want with women, and you and you're very clear with them what you want, when to meet you, and what to do next. Give very clear options. Don't be wishy washy. Don't say what are you doing this weekend. Like what does that mean? Give her meet me here at this time. Do this. It's very clear. Women don't want choices. They want you to take the burden. Um, these are things I've if I known this a long time ago, my life would have been it would have been a lot easier. I have to say I would have, I would have got like maybe I would have got these realizations quicker, but um, but women get very turned on by this um, in the same way that when we see a pair of breasts, it's millions of years of evolution. Um, it's the same thing for them. They they are security seeking creatures. They want to know that you have got it sorted. And even if you haven't, you can still act it, right? You can still go for it. Because mentally, a lot of us still don't have it sorted. We have anxiety. We have our issues. But like I said, you've got to be present to that. Don't, don't buy into that. Go for what you want. Yeah, no. To be fair, Joe, I think that's probably all the same sort of stuff. I wish I knew when I'd first started yep. as well. I think, I think we would have had even better results. I think we probably would have met even better quality women uh, as well yeah. during that, rather than like what what you said about you know don't chase the chase the closed doors, chase the open ones. Yeah, I, man, yeah, that's a big I, one. I, I wholeheartedly agree. That's the PUA I, industry. That's the yeah. PUA industry chasing closed doors. I see all these videos of the infield videos, and I'm like. Five seconds in, she's not interested. Just stop, 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 stop. Just stop. Oh no, he's like, it's a test. I'm just going to break her test. Yeah. Now there are I'll times change when you can mind. Be yeah, yeah. No, I get. Yeah, off. like <laughs> now I have done that. I have done it, but I'm telling you that a lot of these guys, like, look, if you go in with this this mindset of like, look, it's probably not going to, and most women you meet are probably not going to be for you as well. It's a big deal. Mm. I used to think I would try and like 99 percent of women were for me on some level. I could turn them, I could game them, I could do all these things. Now I'm like 99% women probably going to say no. So I don't have any pressure. I don't care. Like they're probably, they're probably married or probably got this problem. They, you know, it's just all the pressure's done. I don't have to worry now. Like I'm not proving anything and it just makes life so much easier when they're not on me. To an end. So it's like, I'll just enjoy the conversation for this conversation. If I can lead it further, I will. 
so that's it. it it makes life so much easier and um yeah like i said i wish i knew that <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I think I think that's but but you know what? It just shows the accumulation of all of that knowledge that you've gathered over the years, which yeah. is again phenomenal. Yeah, really. You know, it's gone. A, I've gone. A, I've gone a full circle, and um, you know, I'm lucky because I can now teach this. I can take a guy. I could take 15 minutes. I could really drum it into them a lot of these mm. concepts, and it's simplicity. You know, you don't want all of these theories, all of these like manifestos and blueprints and uh, it's whatever, too much uh, yeah. rattling around in your head keep it simple you understand what women want and you understand how to give basically as a man um and then you show up you know you show, you show up how you would do um before you learn that you are not good enough before you learn that you have all this bullshit and um she'll love you for it if you leave keep leading and you accept when she says no. You don't, you don't take it personal. You just keep going. Life's good. But that's all you need to know. It's, it's very simple. Very, very simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. Yeah. And then with that knowledge, you can enjoy it. You can go out and meet people everywhere. I meet people all the time. I, I, like I said, I live in here, Vietnam. It's a bit different. There's a language barrier. Uh, <laughs> and, and they're very shy, Vietnamese. They're amazing. But it's to take into consideration like the, the fact that you're this. But I mean, I kind of play it off as like I'm learning, so I kind of cheat a little bit. But, mm. Yeah, but, yeah, it's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. Well, I've I've got just two more questions uh, left to ask you, Joe, right. before I, I let you go for the evening. Um, no worries. One... <laughs> Well, one of the things that I, I love uh, being with, being able to ask people, uh, because I, I do genuinely believe that, you know, even if guys are looking to focus on their dating life, um, that they should take a very holistic approach to yeah. their entire life. You know, if they're not if they're going to work on dating, why not consider, you know, their fitness, nutrition, their style and fashion, maybe getting hobbies, maybe learning how to socialize and stuff. Um, and what I'd actually I'd, I'd love to ask you. Um, besides the coaching that you do, um, being able to help guys either with their anxiety or teaching them how to approach women and build attraction and so on, are there any other coaches that you feel complement uh, the coaching that you do? And it's absolutely fine even then if you give shout outs to maybe there are other dating coaches who also complement your style of doing things. Yeah, I'd say, well, I would say, like I mentioned him a lot, Robert Glover, Dr. Robert Glover, author of No More Mr. Nice Guy. He was a big influence on me. He actually does have a dating um, kind of program. I don't think he's, I don't think he's doing it anymore, but he does, yeah, he's, a lot of his YouTube videos kind of blew my mind. Like it made me, uh, we spoke about John Cooper as well. I don't think he's coaching anymore, but um, another guy, a uh, former RSD coach, uh, Alex Social, um, and as much as you know, I don't know if they're coaching anymore. I don't. I haven't looked. I think he's still got a YouTube channel, and maybe he's still coaching. But a lot of his concepts, he's very holistic. He understands the the the, the female, the the masculine feminine dynamic. That's a big deal. Once you understand that, this becomes very easy. Mm. And I'm like, you know, I'm only naming guys I think are, have got this healthy look. And, and they're people that I would want to emulate. Mm. And that's the issue. You know, a lot of guys out there, I think there's still, that you know, there's still a lot of unresolved things that they're not really telling people. And no, I, I know that because I was like that. And uh, I know them. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Yeah. So, um yeah, Robert Glover, I'd say Alex Social is is a pretty good um has a pretty good insight into this stuff. He was he was coaching with RSD. He came to the same realizations. He was doing these RSD boot camps with all these guys and you know, trying to force these results and he, he, he Did he did he end. come to London at any any time? He's, he's, he's been, been in to... London, yeah. He's been all over the world. The name <laughs> the name rings a bell. I th I think at some point I might have worked with him. I <laughs> No, I mean, I can't RSD, keep yeah, track Alex of Social. stage names, but... Yeah, maybe you did, actually. Yeah, he's been to London a couple of... I've met him a few times. He's yeah. He's a friend of a friend. So, um, very interesting guy. And he has a video called The Enough Manifesto. 
for like two hours. And when I first watched it, I was like, what is this? It's tremendous. Yeah. So I actually watched it last year and it's just so genius. He isn't, I mean, to be, in, in, you know, I don't want to be too critical of him here, but because he really did help me a lot, but he, um, he's not very technically mind, you know, he's not exactly scientific. Very like, he just says what he thinks is probably the issue to this. So, you know, he's not exactly a social scientist in that sense, but yeah, um, it, it, the concepts you get, you get the idea, you know, and a lot of what he says really, really helped me. Um, yeah, so apart from now, I haven't really. Um, I mean, a lot of the guys you now, it's just got this whole red pill movement, um, and it's just I just think there's a lot of it's just a lot of talking. You know, at least pickup was getting out there and speaking to women. You know, that's yeah. Red pill guys, it's like, well, she's not gonna like you because you don't like, earn enough money. She's gonna force you, take half your money. So marriage is pointless. Blah blah blah. But it's, I don't. I just don't think about that. Yeah, it but it like, feels very um, it feels very political now, like as if the the you know you've got to join a team or you've got to join a side and then you have to hate. You know, if if you believe this, then you know, then you're opposed to to that and. Yeah. Yeah, it's been yeah, strategized it, a bit. It's just, it's just tapping into that. It's just tapping into that insecurity of, you know, men have got this angst, and that's why these 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 role models are coming up. It's not that they are. It, it, it's just, it's just feeling a need. You know, that's mm. why, why that's why a brand will come to the surface because it feels that need. Um, it isn't necessarily because of that brand. Um, Andrew Tate's an example. It's just feeling a need. People are being told, look, you know, like, and, and it's, it's, I'm not saying I agree with Andrew Tate. I really don't. I think a lot of it's, I can tell it's insecurity a lot on his part. But the reason he's followed is because he's saying these things. And it's, 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 it's the result of society. You know, it's, it's, it's what's happening to men who don't have these role models. So that the next common, common denominator will be somebody like Andrew Tate. And all it is is it's tapping into that anger because a lot of young men are angry. You know, they're like, they've got this victim mentality. You know, they're, they're like, why me? And it's understandable. It's I I I sympathise with it. You know, I understand it. In some mm. ways. So, and pickup was kind of generational. It was kind of the, it was the kind of uh, it. They were and you know, our Andrew Tate is pickup. You know, it is it's next generation, isn't it? So yeah. And once upon a time, um, I mean. I mean, I remember when I first got into it, how pickup was trendy. Like, you could show off to your friends, like, "Look, I can go and talk to a girl now," and and then well, go yeah, off and was, do it. I didn't. Really, I was so unself aware that what I was doing was so crazily, crazily sort of like unsocially calibrated. I like, imagine just be like, I remember bumping into my mate at school and being like, "Yeah, watch this," and he was like, "What? We're just talking. Like, you don't have to do that." Yeah. It's so weird. When I look back, I'm like, why did I do that? Oh, I print, you yeah. Know, you well, we all print. we all have those moments anyway. We all have we all those have like, those yeah, yeah. It's I think it just goes part of the territory again with um yeah. with being in the industry, you know. Um, but no, I I do I absolutely it's, I think it's brilliant. Uh, but no, honestly, Joe, being able to chat to you has been absolutely yeah, man, been fantastic, great. and you know, and and thank you so much as well for giving me so much of your time. Uh, if anything, it's my yeah, last no, question cool. to you. Um, Please let guys know like how they can find you and uh, tell me a bit more or tell them a bit more about what you're doing these days, um, being able to help guys with their dating um, and yeah, anything else that you you want to share? Uh, yeah, I have um, I have a coaching session. Um, it takes about an hour. Overcoming limiting beliefs under getting to know why you sabotage with women, whatever it is in life, but especially with women in relationships. Um, a lot of what we've spoken about here, I've got certain techniques. And I honestly don't think it would take long, really, to, if I got stuck in with a guy um, to find out really, uh, to really get down to the causes, to the root causes of anxiety. Um, so that's an online coaching session, um, inexpensive. I would say then I've got an online video course, which is about dating. I've called it the, the, I think, conscious. It's called conscious attraction. 
the last dating guide you'll ever need. About thirty videos. You can you can watch it pretty quickly. It's quite quite to the point, um, and it goes over a little bit of what we spoke about tonight. Which uh, mm. yeah, I tried to just get get it down to but to find me. Actually, it's actually quite hard to find me on Facebook. My YouTube channel isn't very big. It's just it's called Solid in a Game. Uh, but if I send you a link over, um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Give, give me literally absolutely everything, and I will put it in the yeah. in the description and, and share it for people. Yeah, so that's it. Um, and yeah, if you, I'll put my Facebook link. If people want to message me, I've got a Facebook group. My Facebook group is probably my main uh, way of communicating. So if you want to join the Facebook group, um, yeah. So that's it, really. Uh, I don't, um, don't know anything else to promote that much. That's just, yeah. No, well, honestly, again, Joe, thank you so much for for giving me your time, and and I really love that. Right. Uh, the topic that we spoke about with that. And I know I, I'd sort of said to you like, oh, I'd love to also ask you about with uh, being a foreigner abroad and, you know, in the dating life. Yeah, we could, but... yeah, we'll go that time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because I think we've covered so much good stuff there. I think it would only just pull it away, uh, the attention yeah. of it and be very overwhelming for for guys. So no, absolutely. Another time I'd love to be able to interview you again. Um, Amazing. I, yeah. You've always got yeah, such... Yeah, a lot of the stuff I feel like I've scratched the surface on a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of this stuff I haven't actually... I, I, I'm good at writing. Mm. So my Facebook group's good at, like, a lot of it's just posts, very to the point, you know, guys. But articulating this, like, speaking, it, I haven't done for a while. So, yeah, let's do another Let's do another interview and uh, dig deep on some of that yeah. stuff. Well, but you've always got such good insights. So, yeah, no, honestly, it's been an absolute appreciate pleasure it. to talk to you. And like I say, you've always got such amazing insights into this stuff. Yeah. And you're one of the... A handful of people that i know who has not only been in the industry for a long time but you're still in it in some form or another which is brilliant so yeah no honestly yeah, thank you very much joe